Bolo year of Galer, August Falter Roiv, Goody Cashlan Valyach Clea, is more on an orang's privilege doing Shiva Belling Eranokod Special to Shah. Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome to Dublin Castle. It's a great honour and privilege to have you here with us on this very special occasion, the joint inaugural meetings of the two new citizens' assemblies on biodiversity loss and a directly elected mayor for Dublin. We're joined today by the 180 brand new members of the two assemblies who unfortunately can't be with us in this historic St. Patrick's Hall, but whose noses are pressed against computer screens the length and breadth of the country. My name is Art O'Leary. I have the privilege of being secretary to the two assemblies. I've never had 180 bosses before, but I'm very much looking forward to the experience. The format today is very straightforward. Um, firstly, we'll hear a message from the Taoiseach, Michal Martin, TD, who will formally convene the two assemblies. We'll then meet the two chairpersons, Dr. Evie Nihulawain and Jim Gavin, who will outline their visions for each of the assemblies. We'll also hear from Dr. Clota Harris from University College Cork and one of the planet's leading thinkers on deliberative democracy. Clodagh will speak to us about citizens' assemblies and why they are important. And finally, we'll hear from former members of the three previous citizens' assemblies who will share their experience with us and offer some advice and guidance about how we might make the most of this extraordinary opportunity to influence the development of policy on biodiversity loss and local government in Dublin. So without much further ado, we can hear from Antishuk Michal Martin TD. A Kahirlig, a Korlori, a Green Ushla, a Skush Ahishdom, on Desh Shah Avegam, Lord Liv, a Krenu, Chanskinev, Jonolocha, Nosseronig. Chairpersons, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you at the inaugural meeting of the Citizens' Assemblies on Biodiversity Loss and on a directly elected mayor for Dublin. Once again, we are at an important moment in the political and democratic life of our country. And once again, we are placing the people at the heart of the consideration of proposals which could have a significant impact on the way we live our lives. These two new Citizens' Assemblies will provide a means by which everyday people who normally don't get the opportunity to be involved in policy development or legislative proposals to make a very real and direct contribution to the state's response to both biodiversity loss and the structure of local government in Dublin. The last two assemblies and the constitutional convention that came before them each contributed enormously to the democratic discourse that took place within the Oireachtas and played a vital role in informing the development of government policy. And they were instrumental in helping shape the public's understanding of some very complex and nuanced issues. Active citizenship is essential for democracy and the democratic process, and it depends entirely on the willingness of people to perform the duties of citizenship. The government was greatly heartened to learn that over 3,700 people registered to take part in these two citizens' assemblies, thus underlining the commitment of the Irish people to this model of deliberative democracy and the importance of the issues involved. Following the relaxation of eligibility for assembly membership, the newly enhanced diversity of the two groups will also add significantly to the richness of the debate and to the final recommendations. I know every one of the members of these two assemblies have busy lives and yet you have agreed to devote, to devote a significant proportion of your free time for the remainder of this year to the tasks before you. So, on behalf of the government, I would like to thank you most sincerely for your participation. I would like to thank, in particular, Dr. Eving Nihulavoin and Jim Gavin for accepting my invitation to chair these two assemblies. Biodiversity loss and a directly elected mayor for Dublin are challenging subjects. But we are fortunate 
to have two chairs who will bring particular knowledge, expertise and passion to these issues. I know that under the skilled stewardship of your chairpersons, Avine and Jim, membership of the Citizens' Assemblies that are getting underway here today will be an enriching experience for all of you. In the programme for government, the three government parties committed ourselves to an ambitious programme of dynamic reform to better reflect the changing needs of a vibrant modern society. The programme included proposals for four citizens' assemblies during the lifetime of this government. We are now entrusting you, the new members of the Biodiversity Loss and Dublin Assemblies, with the responsibility to listen to a broad spectrum of opinion, to weigh up the evidence, exercise your judgment and to use your wisdom and life experience together to arrive at reasoned and informed recommendations on the matters before you. Please be assured that the government and the houses of the Oireachtas are listening and waiting to hear from you. We have committed to considering seriously the fruits of your endeavours. May I wish you every success in your efforts. Gnairi live, agus berbua, agus banacht satauchi. Gorv milamagiv galer. Gormagata Hishig, and I think we can all add our admiration and thanks to the 180 citizens who have so selflessly agreed to give up their time this year to act as members of the Assembly. I spoke to a number of you this week and I have to say that a, a more enthusiastic and engaged bunch would be very hard to meet. And speaking of engaged and enthusiastic, that segues neatly to our next speaker, the chairperson of the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss, Dr. Evin Nuhulwain. Evin, known to many of you, is an assistant professor in the School of Mathematics in UCD and is probably better known to us as a socially engaged academic, a communicator and a leader in the STEM field. It's my great pleasure to introduce the chairperson and invite her to take to the podium to outline her vision and plans for the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss. Thank you very much for those kind words of welcome and inspiration. I'm also incredibly grateful to the new members of these two assemblies for agreeing to participate in this wonderful exercise in deliberative democracy, for giving generously of their time today and in the coming weeks and months, and for the energy enthusiasm they've shown so far um, in this exercise. We are following in a great, if relatively recent, tradition in this country of deliberating on and discussing potential change through an exercise in listening and in learning. Ireland, I'm finding out, is an international leader in this field and from the outcome of the marriage referendum to the implementation of recommendations on tackling the climate crisis, the citizens' assemblies have delivered real change in the way we live our lives and indeed they've bridged the gap between people, their public representatives and policies. I am incredibly honoured and delighted to have been asked by the Taoiseach to chair um, the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss and I look forward to learning with you and from you about this important issue. I also look forward to hearing from the three members of our previous assemblies later this afternoon who will share their reflections on their experiences and I hope we can build on these experiences with the Citizens' Assemblies that are going to be taking place in 2022. It's disappointing that we're not able to meet in person today, but I am looking forward to the first meeting of the Assembly on Biodiversity Loss on May 14th, where we'll attempt to come to grips with this important and complex issue. And we'll begin our task of answering how should the state respond to the crisis of biodiversity loss. Rud Khotovachtach, Lenardanga, Arkeol, Agasarlitriot. This question of solving the crisis of biodiversity loss may well belie the challenging nature of the subject, which, as I am only learning now, is a major global, European, local and national issue that affects us all. It probably doesn't get the focus that it deserves, as it's a problem that really requires collaborative action around the world. From the health of the soil to the quality of the food that we're eating, from the populations of flora and fauna around us to the cleanliness of the water that we're drinking, it's an enormous, enormous issue, but it's one that we can make a difference on, and that's why the work in the Citizens' Assembly is going to be really exciting. 
In the wake of the time capsules on the national census taken last weekend, I can imagine we, and certainly I, am picturing the generations that might come after us. And I am wondering now what we can do to make sure that our great-great-grandchildren can feel the majesty of an oak tree, can still walk in nature and hear birds and bees, can swim in clean water and can trust in the quality of the food that they're eating. And I'm very much looking forward to learning about this topic as we peel back the very many layers of this problem and, the, and come up with ways of potentially addressing it. It's going to be an evidence-based exercise. Thankfully, we'll be assisted by a, an expert or specialist advisory group who have expansive knowledge and experience in all aspects of biodiversity. I am already deeply indebted to them for giving their time and expertise to shape the programme for the next few months. It's also important for us to recognise that there are so many people across Ireland who are already working in this area and trying to protect biodiversity committed volunteers, academics, environmentalists and farmers who are already knowledgeable and involved in this issue. We'll be meeting many of them over the course of our meeting, listening and learning from them. Our younger generation, those who are under 18, can't be represented in the membership of the Assembly, but it's important that their voice is also heard as part of our deliberations. We're therefore going to set up a special platform online for people who will likely bear the brunt of the world's failures to act on this so far so that they can form our discussions. We hope to feed back to our young people then through educational um, outputs at the conclusion of our work in the Assembly. Our responsibility, our 99 members with, working with me, I hope, our responsibility is to learn as much as we can from as many people as we can and through our considerations and discussions come up with recommendations that we can embed in policy and communicate to our publics and our communities that we engage with every day. Each and every person's voice and input will be valuable to their assembly. I hope that as we work together, friendships and connections, that NOSC that comes about together through spending time and mutual engagement, I hope that will come about, about as this collective activity, this mehel that we're all engaging on. You, the 99 people watching online who have been chosen as the Irish people to deliberate this topic, I hope we'll enjoy this space to listen, to share thoughts, to build ideas with, with each other. Um, it's a group that is broadly representative of our society and some of you may know an awful lot about this subject already and some of you may not, but you all have something equal to contribute and I want to make sure that everyone's voice is heard as we go through our work. I want this work to lead to sustainable and lasting change for the benefit of future generations and our recommendations will likely span the full spectrum of government from environment, climate, communications, to agriculture, food in the marine, to transport, to health. So it will be so important that you also communicate the work that we do as we are learning and as we are going through it. There's an awful lot going on in the world right now, things that we might feel helpless that we can do anything about. But as members of the Citizens' Assembly on Biodiversity Loss, I feel that this is something that we can have a direct influence on. So, Gramagav Galer, Asaktwer Am, Agusbus Agus, Wer Olis, Snobbersha, Tamiknu, La Ober Livsha Galer, Verbua, Agus Fekamishiv, Igan Cooper Shakin. Gurmia Mahagat, Kaherlach. So, there you have it those of you members of the Biodiversity Loss Citizens' Assembly. You're on a voyage of discovery, which will hopefully lead to deep and meaningful change with your recommendations for action to effectively face the challenge with which you have been presented. I was trying to think of a neat segue to our next speaker, but he is a man who needs no introduction to the people of Dublin. Jim Gavin successfully led Dublin GA teams into battle in Croke Park for over a decade, not three kilometres from where we now stand. A former officer in the Defence Forces, Jim now holds a senior management position at the Irish Aviation Authority. As a proud dub, it took me all of my willpower not to wear a navy and sky blue tie today, but I'll try and keep an impartial front. But it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce the Chairman of the Dublin Assembly, Mr Jim Gavin. Kurmogoth Atishok Os Ukt the Quid Fukal Kinalta 
is more an honour August Frivlade, a Ved Kappa Mar Kerhorlock, Aaron Tinol Tironok, the Balyal Clea. Thank you, Taoiseach, for your kind words. It's a great honour and privilege to have been appointed as the Chairman of the Dublin Citizens' Assembly. I live a life of service and I will approach this task with uh, the same dedication, commitment and hard work as I have uh, approached all the challenges in my life, all to the best of my ability. In recent weeks, uh, I have had the opportunity to reflect about the fundamental nature of what constitutes a citizen assembly, or in the Irish language, to know Saronach. There's often a great elegance and clarity in the Irish language, of which we as a people should be very proud of. The literary tr translation of the phrase is a gathering of free people, which to my mind perfectly capsulates and captures the essence of what we set out to achieve in the months ahead. A place is nothing without its people, and people make up communities. So it's a really exciting prospect to have the opportunity to work with 80 free citizens met up from 67 uh, randomly selected citizens of Dublin City and Council, and 12 council councillors selected from across the four Dublin local authorities. We, the free people of this assembly, will have been charged by the houses of Araroctus to consider the type of directly elected mayor and local government structures that are best suited for Dublin. The composition of the membership to include 12 democratically elected councillors is an innovative approach, mirrored as it does in the Convention of the Constitution, which did so successfully launches, launched Ireland's first initiative in deliberative democracy in 2012. I am committed to ensuring that all voices and perspectives are heard from our sitting councillors across the four local authorities and um, in this significant debate for Dublin. And they are making arrangements for a special session of non members to make contributions to engage directly with us. Now, as the teacher mentioned, it is important that the members of the Assembly uh, hear from a broad spectrum on the subject. And I'm delighted that the membership was extended beyond those enrolled in the elected reg register. And the presence of a number of members who were not born in this country will add a welcome diversity to the group bringing, as they do, a wealth of lived experience from beyond our island and its shores. We will also hear from academic, the academic community, local authority staff, Dublin TDs, Dublin members of the European Parliament, civic uh, society groups, non-governmental organisations, service providers in the city and county. When I was asked to, consider the, uh, to be considered for the role of the chair, I accepted without hesitation. I can say with absolute clarity that I have a vested interest. I'm a proud and passionate Dubliner. I want to take this place, Dublin to take its place amongst the great cities of the world, renowned for its quality of life, its sustainable environment, its culture, and its, its, its economic vibrancy and its diversity. I wish to city, see the city of James Joyce announce itself as a poetic and scholarly giant. The city of Luke Kelly, of Mary Black and Imelda May show, showcase its powerful, lyrical and fearless voice. The city of the Hapney Bridge to raise its people above the troubled waters of infrastructural difficulty. The city of Paul McGrath, Katie Harrington, Brian O'Driscoll and Sinead Heron reveal its competitive vitality. The city of the Silicon Dock to affirm its, cult, its cutting edge technology. The city where so many give voluntarily to their time to help others celebrate its generosity. So, on this most special days, can I appeal to everyday citizens of Dublin to engage with the work of this assembly to offer the same passion support of Hill 16 on Match Day, a togetherness which met a stronger summer after summer. Dublin is a great city with a rich heritage and diverse and growing population. But like all cities, Dublin faces major challenges ranging from housing to transport to infrastructure to sustainability and a lot more. These are challenges that affect the daily lives of all Dubliners. 
and the purpose of this assembly is to make recommendations to the houses of our Oireachtas that will have the potential to shape the direction of the city and county of Dublin for generations to come. We need, no, we must hear your thoughts, your fears, your hopes, your vision for Dublin as we plot a, path, uh, plot a pathway together to the future. Your voice, your vision, your viewpoint can shape the city's coming decades. This assembly is a blank canvas that requires your lively brushstrokes to offer colour, texture and structure. This is a unique chance for every son and daughter, every inhabitant of our city and county, regardless of background, to, make, to turn a key that unlocks a glorious future for the next generation of Dubliners. We particularly need to seek out the young people in this debate, who are not members of the Assembly, but whose lives will be directly affected by the recommendations which may emerge from our discussions. We need to seek out those under 18, so they can discover the privileges and possibilities of citizenship while also learning of the responsibilities. I would love to see the conversations in our schools, in our communities, and even amongst friends, where local government structures would not normally be the hot topic of discussion. What kind of Dublin do you wish to live and work in? What do you want from a local government? The pace of change in recent decades has been extraordinary. How can we, as Dubliners, deal with the many and varied challenges that face us? There is no wrong or right door into the Citizen Assembly. You can, of course, make a traditional written submission on the website and come to us through the front door. But the people of Dublin and beyond are welcome to come to the back door, through the windows, through the skylights, and even down through the chimneys. So let's have your TikTok videos, your WhatsApp conversations, your Twitter comments, and your Instagram pictures. We will embrace all formats and all platforms. The most important thing is that we hear what you have to say. Can I say a special word of thanks to our expert advisory group who will support and guide us on this journey. Professor Derek O'Brien from Dublin City University, Dr Ada Quillivan from University College at Cork, Dr Breed Quinn from University of Limerick and Dr Jane Souter from Dublin City, Uni City University. These are some of the finest minds of our generation on this particular subject, and we are most grateful for their expertise and their wise counsel in the months ahead. I would also like to thank Mr. Art O'Leary, Secretary General for our Assembly, and his team for their work and guidance as we begin this exciting journey. 100 years ago, from the creation of the state, the vision of the founding fathers of the city, we have been offered uh, this opportunity to make a contribution to the future of Dublin. We want to see the city of the three castles tower to its historic best, a landmark for excellence, inclusion, innovation and community. We want Dublin to be a great place to live, to work, to visit and to raise a family. So indeed, it is a rare privilege for all of us to be afforded the opportunity to be members of the Dublin Citizens' Assembly and I look forward to working with you all to be our collective best in delivering for the people who matter most, the 1.4 million citizens who call Dublin their home. Go to meal, Margaret. Many thanks, Chairman. Um, wise words indeed. And to the members of the Dublin Citizens' Assembly who are watching and joining us remotely today, it clearly lies within your grasp to identify the kind of Dublin in which you would like to live, work, visit and raise a family. My colleagues and I on the Citizens' Assembly Secretariat very much look forward to supporting you on this particular journey. And now can I introduce our deliberative democracy specialist and a very dear friend, Dr Clodagh Harris from University College Cork. Citizens' Assemblies have become a very important element of the democratic cool toolkit in the last decade, and previous Assemblies have made a serious contribution to changing the way we live our lives in this country today. Claude is going to take to the stage now and speak to us about Citizens' Assemblies and why they are so important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art, for your kind words. Uh, good afternoon. It is an honour and a pleasure to be here today. 
Um, my brief presentation will consider three issues, namely what deliberative democracy is, how it is practiced in citizens' assemblies, and why deliberative democracy is important. So what is deliberative democracy? It is essentially a theory of political legitimacy that argues that a political decision can only be deemed legitimate if it withstands the scrutiny of those who are impacted by it. It argues for citizens to have a more central role in developing responses to real world problems and its core principles are inclusion, equality and informed, respectful and reasoned discussions and decisions. Deliberative Democrats recognise the value of bringing people of diverse opinions, backgrounds and lived experiences together to engage in inclusive recent deliberations that focus on facts, the future and the consideration of the needs of others. There are many sites of deliberative democracy, for example our parliaments, civil society forums, social movements and so on. In the last decade or so, we've witnessed the rapid expansion of deliberative democratic innovations such as citizens' assemblies. Just last year, the OECD reported that 566 deliberative processes had taken place across OECD countries and EU member states since 1979, and that 60% of them had occurred in the last 10 years. These deliberative innovations, democratic innovations, have taken a variety of forms, such as citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries, citizens' panels, and they have looked at a wide range of policy issues at different levels of government, so local, national, European and global, and with varying degrees of impact. Some are standing assemblies, this is a very kind of more recent innovation, that means they are formal institutions, such as the Paris Assembly and the East Belgian Assembly. Others are established on an ad hoc basis. For our part here in Ireland, we have emerged as a world leader in citizens' assemblies, and they have become a common feature of our constitutional and policy landscape. Um, so citizens' assemblies, they endeavour to achieve inclusion through the random selection of participants and they use par professional facilitators to ensure that all members have opportunities to speak and to be heard. As deliberative institutions that emphasise informed and considered recommendations, their processes include a variety of expert witnesses to inform and assist the, the deliberations but they are just one part of a wider deliberative democratic system and they do not seek to replace existing representative institutions such as parliaments and forms of direct democracy such as referendums. Their work feeds into the wider political and policy making processes, usually with great effect. For instance, the OECD in 2021 found that in around two thirds of the deliberative democratic innovations that it studied, at least half of the participants' recommendations were accepted by the public authorities. 11% of them had none of their recommendations accepted, compared with 28% that had all of their recommendations fully accepted. So I suppose to come to the final part then really, why are deliberative democratic innovations important? And they're important for a variety of reasons. Citizens' assemblies can increase inclusion, expertise, transparency and participation in political decision making. They can be a valuable means of ensuring that voices that may, not, that may be marginalised or overlooked by more traditional political processes are heard. They can facilitate more equitable decisions and enhance democratic legitimacy as those bound by a decision are involved in making it. In terms of expertise, their value lies in their capacity to harness diverse forms of experience and evidence to develop clear policy recommendations. And this can lead to more innovative policy solutions to better informed decision making greater acceptance of decisions and fewer implementation problems. The work of citizens' assemblies can increase wider public understanding of a topic and lead to a more informed electorate. Transparency is increased 
with, through the citizens' assemblies processes by bringing citizens directly into the decision-making process and by making the work of the assembly and the responses to its recommendations public. In terms of participation, citizens' assemblies afford opportunities for citizen influence on policies above and beyond elections. They can help move politics and decision-making beyond short-termism and offer new ways of tackling wicked problems such as social and environmental policy challenges. They can motivate those who choose not to take part in traditional forms of politics to participate and help build trust in society and politics. The Irish cases which have been mentioned already um, this afternoon show that citizens' assemblies can make a difference in terms of constitutional change and political processes. To date, they have led to four, four constitutional referendums in Ireland, three of which have passed, as well as promises of future referendums. They have also contributed to policy change in climate action, as well as revisions to parliamentary procedures. The Irish Citizens' Assembly process also highlights how such assemblies can work successfully alongside representative and direct forms of democracy to the benefit of the overall health of our democracy. Ireland has shown that deliberation can be included into the referendum process. Research by uh, Professor Yossel King et al on the marriage equality and the abortion referendums finds not only high levels of awareness of the work of the respective citizens' assemblies, but that this was a strong factor in determining the yes vote in each case. The same is true for the bearing they've had on deliberation in Parliament and parliamentary committees, where they have, in effect, co-designed policy on climate action. So, to conclude, the work you do together over the coming months has great power to shape all of our futures for the better. I wish you the very best of luck with your deliberations. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Clauda. Mila Vuikas. And as a member of the Biodiversity Loss Expert Advisory Group, Clauda will make sure that we stay on track and obey all the rules. Please don't be fooled by her gentle demeanour um, here today. Um, Clauda has such an iron will and steely determination that Jim could probably have used her on, as fullback on one of the more famous Dublin teams. And now to the final element of today's meeting. Um, a, a part that I've been really looking forward to. Um, can I introduce you to three very special guests? Uh, firstly, Deirdre Donaghy, who was a member of the original Convention on the Constitution. I met Deirdre for the first time ten years ago when we were recruiting for that particular assembly. Claire O'Connor, in the middle, was a member of the assembly charged with considering the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution climate change, older people, and how we uh, deal with referendums in this country. And last but not least, Jerry Crowley was a member of the most recent Citizens' Assembly on Gender Equality, uh, the recommendations of which are currently being considered by an Oireachtas committee. So, Deirdre, can I come to you first? Um, would you like to just tell us a little bit about your experience as a member of the Convention on the Constitution? I would do it again in the morning, so if anybody wants to swap places, <laughs> you know, contact me. Um, but yeah, the, 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 citizen, uh, the Convention on the Constitution was the first of these, I suppose, so I had no idea what to expect going into it. Uh, I was very much afraid it was going to be like a plus one at a wedding, where you just you know, had an awful day and, and you know, <laughs> tried to make stilted conversation with people, but it was nothing like that. Um, I was all, we had politicians as part as one third of the membership of that assembly as well, and again, the, you know, there was a, an expectation that they would dominate all of the discussions, and you know, you'd be sitting in the corner uh, saying nothing, and it was nothing like that. It was a really, really interesting experience. Um, we got to talk about a range of, of different issues. We got to genuinely talk about them. Um, people came, you know, experts on on both sides of any given topic. Us. 
we had uh, people like Bodar in the room who, who actually you know, knew the truth behind subjects, so you didn't have the usual quoting of, of misrepresentative studies and so on. It, it had to be quite accurate. And we, I was really impressed by how much people were willing to talk, but how much people were willing to listen. And you know, people had very different views, and you, know, you might have gone in assuming what people's views are, and it was you know, good to see as well that the, the views that you might expect people to have isn't necessarily true either. That you, know, you might assume, oh, an older person will think this, a younger person will think that, and um, you know, a rural person will think this, and it, it's good to see that often you're wrong in that. Um, and people are very different when you give them a chance to talk, and, and that people are willing to listen. Okay. Yeah, th th thank you so much, Deirdre. And it's astonishing that even 10 years later, you're able to speak with such passion and engagement about that experience. So um, for those 180 members watching, please take note. Yes. If I can come to Claire now. Um, Claire, your Citizens' Assembly obviously was, a, uh, was under the spotlight um, by many, many people in this country because you had to deal with such sensitive and complex issues. Have you any advice for our new citizens about how they might approach their two citizens' assemblies? Yes, well, I, I would really agree with what Deirdre said, and I found the process incredibly inspiring in how open-minded all of the citizens were when they came in. So I would really advise people to come in with an open mind. It's such a, a special space to be in, to be in a room full of people who are making policy recommendations who leave their party politics at the door. No one's thinking about the, lex the next election. People really come in with the best interests of the country at heart, so I would really recommend to just leave any kind of preconceived notions or judgments that you have um, at the door. Um, and then I suppose I was, uh, I was young when I did it. I was 22 when I did the assembly. Um, and I think initially there was a feeling of maybe not feeling confident enough to contribute. And I would say to any of the young people that are part of this that you have so much to contribute here, um, particularly for these really complex issues. That the, the reason we're talking about these issues is because they're, they are difficult and they are complex and they're not going to be solved with the same type of thinking that got us into these problems. Um, so, for example, biodiversity. Um, it's a really big issue and I think that young people, and not even just young people, but people who have been traditionally excluded from these types of conversations have so much to add to it and I think it's really positive that this assembly in particular has um, really gone above and beyond I think in improving the diversity. Um, yeah and then just I suppose to add to what Evian said earlier that you're really, we're thinking about our grandkids and our great grandchildren here um, and to really take a step back and to, to remember that it's for future generations and that there's a really big opportunity that you have here to make a really positive impact. Great, Claire, you're very kind. Thank you. Wise words indeed to live by um, and, and good advice for our citizens who are embarking on this voyage of discovery. Jerry, if I can come to you now. Um, you had to, obviously, in the most recent Citizens' Assembly, you had to deal with the challenge of doing business during a pandemic. And we're all here virtually today, which it certainly is a different kind of experience, and we're losing the richness and intimacy of an in-person engagement. But you might share some advice with us, or perhaps some guidance about how to do business properly um, from your living room. Yeah, thanks indeed, and great to be here today. And I look out this fantastic room, and I see cameras and lights and, and screens, and so it's not the experience I had when I was here for the first inaugural a presentation of our Citizens' Assembly on gender equality where we had a room full of people, where we interacted, where we discussed the excitement of taking on the challenge of our Citizens' Assembly. But you're right, then COVID came upon us. We had to quickly decide what was going to happen to our Assembly. Would we postpone it? Would we stall it? Would we continue in some shape or fashion? And we took the decision, a brave decision I think at the time, to move totally online. So that meant 99 citizens and the Chair and the Secretariat and the supports we had discovering of how this was going to work. How would we work as a team or as a group and interact online instead of in the, the physical space? But I think we all went to it with the vision of let's try our best, help people that may have problems with technology. Some of us would use technology every day of the week in our, in our day job, etc. But it was to bring everybody to the same level 
skilled that we could understand the use of Zoom and other technologies for the, for the purpose in hand. And you know, it worked really well because everybody still got the opportunity to take part. Everybody could uh, raise a hand or, or put some comment on chat, etc. And even the voting process worked very well online. Thank you very much. We're obviously hopeful that we will be able to get the members of the two assemblies in a room together, but fingers crossed, and just in case, these are again uh, indeed wise words. And if I can just conclude maybe with the same question for the three of you, um, and it's a very personal question, so you can be circumspect in how you um, re reply to this. Can I ask each of you to tell us if membership has, of, of the assembly has helped you in your daily lives or has changed you in any way? Deirdre, perhaps first. I helped you as a person. Yeah. It said really it, it helped me or it, it restored a bit of my faith in people um, because when you have debates normally leading up to uh, elections, referendums uh, and so on, they tend to be really divisive, um, really uh, I suppose targeting the lowest common denominator, their personal pot shots against people, and their, you know, misrepresenting information. And we just had such a better quality of debate in the assembly, and I think it, it showed a way that that could be done. Um, that you could have a debate, you could go into a, you could go into an issue, and as I said, there were some weeks I went in and I thought, you know, I, I know my opinion on this before I start. I don't need to listen to anybody. I, I know where I'm coming from. And actually, when you sat down and, and you listened, and you had people who were who were trying to inform, and they weren't trying to lecture you, and they weren't haranguing, or they weren't taking pot shots. They were just giving some some good factual information and you had a chance to discuss it and hear people's views, um, that I think then we could see that, you know, I changed my mind on some weekends um, once I could see the reasons behind the, you know, the different sides of a, of, a, of, a, of a position. And I found it really valuable. And I think it was a great example of how we can have a much better informed national debate and on, on difficult subjects, that if you just try and make it in one way less personal to, to take away the personal attacks but just in another way then you just make it much more personal because it's, it's looking at well what's the real effects what are people's views without being horribly nasty about it <laughs> but yeah, I found that it, it it did really give me a lot more faith in the the choices that people can make when they've had the chance of having a good proper discussion. Thank you. Claire? Yes, I would absolutely agree with Deirdre in terms of, uh, it gave me hope, I suppose, yeah, as well, <laughs> that if people are informed, they will make really valuable recommendations and the right policy decisions will be made. Um, for me personally, I suppose the, the two weekends we spent on climate change was the biggest, I suppose, it was really earth shattering for me because I, did, I went in knowing nothing about climate change at all. Um, and I was just finishing college, just about to venture out into the working world. Um, and I realised that climate change was going to be a huge part of the future for us, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, the assembly changed my the way I saw the world completely and kind of shattered my relatively safe way I'd seen the world before that. So since the assembly, I've gone on to do a master's in climate change policy. Uh, and I'm now working in the area of climate change policy and advocacy. And th the reason I chose policy is because I've seen from the Assembly what a massive impact you can make through policy and what a big change it can have to Ireland. So, yeah, wow. big well, impact. It's had an extraordinary <laughs> impact yeah. and, and will probably shape your future then as well. So, um, congratulations and well done. And, and Jerry, um, to bring this segment to a conclusion, perhaps some personal thoughts about the, the Citizens' Assembly and you. Yeah, I found it life-changing. I found it so privileged to be part of the Assembly and what it could bring to, to the citizen, to the wider public, uh, to the community. And in fact, we have our own Citizens' Assembly WhatsApp group, so we keep in touch, even though the Citizens' Assembly has finished. We're in regular touch, we've made great friends, uh, we're planning trips as the Citizens' Assembly group of 2020, 2021. So there's a great social interaction as well in, there, in that part. But personally, I just became more focused on, I suppose, what can I do as a citizen? What can I, how can I become more involved in my own community? What can I do as a citizen, I suppose, to implement change more? And that's what the Citizens' Assembly brought to me. 
I became a peace commissioner, I became a member of the local credit union as a director, things I wouldn't have done had I not been through this journey. So I'm thankful for that. Great. And to the 180 members watching, um, sounds like you're going to be busy in the future um, fr from next year onwards. Um, and on that note, um, we have reached the end of the public part of the meeting and we say goodbye to the members of the public who tuned in to watch the proceedings today. May I just appeal to each and every one of you to engage with the work of the two assemblies. You know, we're open for business and we're really, really keen to hear your voice. To the 178 other members of the assemblies, can I ask you to just stay logged in and bear with us for a few moments? Um, we're going to move into a private um, part of the discussion uh, to discuss in greater detail our work programme and the arrangements for the months ahead. Gramil Mohagwiv, Berbog is Banak Satauki.